Hey, what up? Welcome to the premiere episode of Twisted Philly. There's so much mayhem, mischief, and nefarious goings on in the city of brotherly love. That's right, folks. This is a podcast dedicated to my favorite things about the city of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania at large. We're going to get into true crime, haunted history, phenomenally creepy places to visit like abandoned cemeteries, legends, who knows what the hell I'll get up to each week in the twisted city of Philadelphia. I may sometimes talk about the mundane, like my favorite place to get cannolis in Philly, um, which is Termini's. There's no other place to get cannolis, so don't even ask. And while the show is called Twisted Philly, sometimes we're going to drive a little farther because as twisted as it can get in Philly, there is a whole lot of twisted shit going on in Pennsylvania. And I like to talk about it. If you're a Philly girl like me, okay, and let me be honest, at the start, I don't actually live in Philly. I live in a Philly suburb. But like most suburbans, when people ask where we live, we say Philly. So if you're a Philly girl or a Philly guy, hit me up and tell me what you would like to hear about. I'm on Twitter and Facebook at Twisted Philly, or you can send me an email at twistedphilly at outlook.com. I spent considerable time thinking about what I wanted to cover on this first episode. Um, that is, of course, once I got over the fact that my voice is pitchy. Um, I'm still not over that shit. I'm also not over the fact that as much as I like to think I don't, I really do have a Philadelphia accent, but I'm going to push past all that. There are so many episodes in my head, and for the first one, I wanted to bring out something truly twisted, like a Philly serial killer. I'm not talking about Gary Heidnick. I may get to him in a future episode, but he's been done so many times and done so well that I really wanted to start with something that hopefully will be new to you. So today's story is the story of a collector. Now, we're collectors in my family. I collected dolls when I was little, as did my daughter, and as did my mom. Um, I collect action figures now, and I guess technically action figures are still dolls, but somehow I feel infinitely cooler um, with the idea of action figures, and now my nerd points are showing. Um, my daughter collects snow globes. My mom, in fact, still collects dolls, and she's got the seriously old, antique, creepy-ass porcelain ones that are the size of toddlers. I, I know you know the ones I'm talking about. They've got enormous glass eyes, and you swear they're going to come to life and kill you in your sleep. Some people collect stamps, but the collector I'm going to share with you today collects something a bit more disturbing. Dead bodies. Yes, folks, we're talking about Philadelphia corpse collector, Mr. Harrison Marty Graham. Now, this story takes place in the 80s, and for whatever reason I don't understand, the 80s were like the generation of the rise of the serial killer. In the 80s, I was listening to Duran Duran, and um, who am I kidding? I still listen to Duran Duran, and performing in school plays like I was headed for Broadway. And I was completely ignorant in my little teenage bubble about people like Arthur Bishop, Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez, and they were at the fucking peak of their killing sprees. So this story starts in August of 1987, and on August 9th, just one week after my 18th birthday, police were called to an apartment building in an area of North Philadelphia. And the tenant there was a man named Harrison Marty Graham, but everybody called him Marty. So for the sake of today's story, I'm gonna call him Marty too. He was 28 at the time, and Marty suffered from an intellectual disability and severe drug addiction. Marty was the oldest of five children born to Lillian Graham, and at the time, he was described as a tall, attractive, African-American man with medium brown skin and large, broad shoulders. Now, I've checked out pictures of Marty online, and I agree. He was a pretty good-looking guy with big, soulful eyes. Um, ladies, what is it about serial killers being attractive? Of course, not all of them, but with Marty Graham, that description definitely fits. Here's the other thing that creeps me out about serial killers, and the ones from Philly are no different. Not only are some of them referred to as attractive, but they're often described as nice and kind and quiet. Again, the description is no different for Marty. He was very well known in his neighborhood, and most people that knew him considered him friendly. He was a local handyman, and even neighborhood children were a big fan of Marty's because he liked to talk like the Cookie Monster from Sesame Street. He had a Cookie Monster puppet that he showed around to the kids. 
So Marty sounds harmless enough, right? Well, there is an entirely different side to Marty, and that's the side we're going to talk about today. Marty lived on North 19th Street near Cecil B. Moore Avenue. Now, this neighborhood was an area of the city with pretty heavy drug activity. A large majority of the buildings in the neighborhood were abandoned and boarded up. There was a significant homeless presence. There were drug addicts, drug dealers, people living in squalor. So this neighborhood was hell. And in the Philly summer heat, it really made it seem like a living hell on earth. Marty lived there for about four years. And on this day in 1987, he was evicted because of horrible odors wafting from his apartment. Now, summer in Philly is hot. Um, right now we're in, I don't know, our fourth or fifth heat wave. I'm not sure which one. And we're getting heat indexes that on some days are as high as 110. So you could be doing something completely harmless like cooking eggs in the summer, but with the heat, it's going to smell like sulfur from the gates of hell. And trust me when I say cooking was the last thing Marty was up to. Now, his landlord was a man named Nathaniel Choice, and Nathaniel sent his son and nephew to clear out Marty's apartment after he'd been evicted. They were able to get into the apartment, but they couldn't open the back room, which was Marty's bedroom, because, and this takes balls, Marty nailed the door shut um, because he said he wanted to protect his belongings. Um, I can't say I blame Nathaniel for sending somebody else in to clear out the place, because if you get evicted for nasty odors, just what in the hell are you keeping inside? When they couldn't open the door, the kids peeked through the keyhole, and what they saw inside was enough to call the cops. Now, the responding officer clearly drew the short straw at the office that day, and his name was Pete Scalatino. Now, Officer Scalatino gets on the scene, and this apartment building has no door, broken windows, but he goes in, and he goes upstairs to Marty's third floor apartment. What do you think that horrible smell was emanating from his room? A cop knows right away. It's the smell of death, folks. Bodies decomposing in the hot Philly summer. So Officer Scalatino walks into the front room of the apartment, and he can barely navigate the room because there are waist-high piles of trash. Harmless, innocuous items like food containers, magazines, newspapers. And then the deeper he moves, there's more nefarious things like used syringes, broken glass from the windows, and, okay, this one really made me kind of sick. Um, jar after jar of yellow liquid. I, I'm not even going to take a guess at what that was. But we're talking some seriously disturbing hoarding going on here. And as if the smell and the trash isn't bad enough, it would seem that Marty is a bit of an artist because he's drawn a crude rendering of a naked woman on the kitchen wall in what looks like dried blood. Yeah, I don't know about you, but in my kitchen, I have bowls with vegetables painted on them hanging on my walls. So we've got trash. We've got the scent of human decay in the air. We've got blood paintings on the wall. And somewhere there must be a dead animal because as if that combination of terror isn't enough, there is dog shit all over the floor. Welcome to Twisted Philly in the summer of 1987. But Officer Scalatino isn't thwarted by any of this. He makes his way through the apartment to Marty's bedroom, or at least what he assumes is Marty's bedroom because the name Marty is scrawled on the door. And he looks through the keyhole as the children did earlier and sees a black woman's naked legs. Now this woman isn't moving, but Officer Scalatino follows procedure. He knocks on the door, he announces himself, he requests that she open the door. Again, no response. This woman isn't moving, she is obviously deceased and the source of the odiferous stench. Officer Scalatino isn't alone. With him is an investigator from the medical examiner's office, a gentleman named Charles Johnson. And these two clearly have way more balls than I do because they pry open that door. I can tell you there's no way in hell I would have opened that door after seeing what was on the other side through the keyhole. But this is their job. So they get the door open and almost immediately are completely overwhelmed by the smell. They don face masks, and the trash in the living room was bad, but the bedroom isn't much different. Besides the trash is the victim. And this poor woman is naked on mattresses piled too high on the floor. I'm not going to share gory details. Let's just say she's been deceased for quite a while. As if this scene isn't bad enough, 
Next to the mattresses on the floor is a second victim, another African-American woman, also deceased and also probably for a while. The difference, though, is victim number two is actually clothed. So thank God for small favors and preserving this woman's dignity. So think about this with me. We're in a tenement building in a neighborhood surrounded by abandoned buildings, people suffering from drug addiction. It's entirely possible that these women were hanging out at Marty's apartment, listening to him do his Cookie Monster impersonation, doing some drugs with Marty, and unfortunately OD'd at his place. It's possible, but it's not fucking likely, and that's what Officer Scalatino thought. So he calls for backup. Clearly the scene has a lot more going on than he imagined. He calls Philly homicide detective James Hansen, and I wanted to point that out because if that name sounds at all familiar to you, it should, because Detective Hansen led the Gary Heidnick investigation. So if there's anyone in the city of Philadelphia who's equipped to handle nefarious shit, it's Detective Hansen. And the scene is gruesome. The environment doesn't help. The boarded windows are blocking any natural light. There's no lights within the apartment. And it's turning into a circus outside because as more police cars arrive and more officers come to assist, medical examiner vans, all of that commotion is drawing more and more bystanders congregating on the 1600 block of North 19th Street. And the day just grows hotter and more humid as the afternoon progresses. There's storms building. The air is thick and wet. Investigators bring in high-intensity lights to help offset the darkness. And the old expression, many hands make light work, is apparent in this situation because now that there's more officers digging through the crime scene, they find a third body. And this victim is found under one of those massive trash piles. Folks, this one has been deceased for a very, very long time. The remains are skeletal. Yeah, what the police find in Marty's apartment is a skeleton. Soon after, victim number four is found, again, under a pile of trash. And this victim has become mummified in the sheets in which it was bound. As the afternoon moves on, we get to about 5.30, and that's a little over five hours since Marty was evicted. And that's when the fifth body was found. And this victim was found between the mattresses in Marty's bedroom. Yeah, to me, this is like some fucked up version of the princess and the pea. Marty slept on a mattress with a dead woman next to him and another one below him between the mattresses. Now, like victims three and four, victim number five was also deceased for quite a while. And the body was so badly decomposed that it was beyond the point of recognition as either male or female. While all this activity is happening in Marty's bedroom and living room, another officer discovers the sixth victim. This body was wedged in a front closet. It was covered with a sheet and tied with electrical cords. After body number six, the investigation winds down in Marty's apartment. No other victims are discovered there, and the police use high-intensity lights again in other parts of the apartment building. They're concerned that Marty may have stashed bodies somewhere else either in empty units or in the basement. It begins to rain, and at dusk, the search is halted on that first day. And meanwhile, there's no sign of Harrison Marty Graham. He took off, he is in hiding, and he's hiding deep. And if there's any chance that he's in sight of his neighborhood, he's going to see the shit show that this has become around his apartment building, because by now the media has shown up. And this story is drawing more than just lit neighborhood locals. What are they watching? Besides the commotion with the police going in and out, they're watching a macabre parade of body bags, which are coming out in sequence, maybe every 45 minutes from Marty's apartment. At dawn the next day on August 10th, the search resumes and police expand the search to the building exterior and other locations on the block. This street is full of abandoned buildings, full of secrets and so many places to hide a body. Oh my God, did I just say that? Um, okay, that was creepy as hell, my bad. Um, they're searching the roof of Marty's apartment building, and they find a large canvas bag. It's hiding underneath. Just, just wait for it. Do you want to take a guess? The bag is under a mattress. Do you see the fucking theme here with this guy? Inside the bag is a leg. Oh, God. Um, a fucking leg and some foot bones. I just, I, I can't even... So over the next week, the search for Marty intensifies. Police question his landlord and the landlord's son and nephew. None of them have any idea where Marty could be. 
but the police are able to put together a profile based on information they receive from his mother and other members of the community and in the neighborhood. What was he wearing? Where does he like to hang out? What does he like to do? Where do they think they might be able to locate him? Marty liked to take long walks and play basketball with local children, which sounds like something you would put in an online dating profile. So over the next week, there are numerous Marty sightings at various locations in Philadelphia, at homeless shelters, at soup kitchens, on city buses. But somehow with all of these people throughout the city seeing Marty, he manages to evade police. While the search for Marty continues, the efforts to identify his victims and their manner of death is just beginning. Now, Robert Catherman was the acting medical examiner at the time in 1987, and he led this crucial forensic process. The first two bodies found were both African-American females, likely in their late 20s or early 30s. And they had only been killed, the medical examiner determined, within about 10 days of their discovery. Again, the disgusting Philly heat and humidity caused them to decompose quickly, which I guess means that if you're trying to dispose of a corpse, you'll want to do it in Philly in the summer. For these two women, the cause of death, and that's where the community made a difference, and it started with the roommate of a woman named Sandra Garvin. Sandra's roommate, after seeing the horrific story on the news, went to the police station and told them that Sandra had been missing for a few months. Now, the roommate was worried that Sandra could be among Marty's victims. So when I read that, my first thought was, bitch, why didn't you go to the cops when your roommate went missing? Um, but I realized that's very judgy of me. In another case, uh, a husband went to the police to report his wife was missing, again, believing she may have been a victim of Harrison Marty Graham. The investigators were still clearing the crime scene at Marty's apartment, digging through the nightmare of those waist-high piles of trash, and eventually they began to recover numerous personal items among the debris, and they hoped that these personal items would provide leads for the victims. Unfortunately, the victim count grew. As police continued to search the area surround Marty's building, on August 15th, a seventh victim was found in the basement of a complex just a short walk down North 19th Street. Now, like the sixth victim found in Marty's closet in his apartment, this body was covered with a blanket and wrapped with an electrical cord, so the M.O. was very similar. What's twisted about these remains, though, is that it was only a head and a torso. So this was either a new eighth victim or the remains belonged to the leg bones that had been found in the canvas bag on Marty's roof. Now, my research didn't yield a definitive answer on that, but I'm going to say that these remains match the remains found on the roof because at no point um, in time did anyone indicate that Marty was charged with eight counts of murder. Everything reflects seven victims, seven counts of murder. Two days later, on August 17th, the search for Marty ended. Now, at this point, he had been running for a little over a week. He was tired, he was hungry, and he was desperate. So he called his mother and asked her to bring him food. Lillian Graham, on that phone call, convinced her oldest child to stop running and to turn himself in. She, in fact, even aided the police because she directed them to the street corner where Marty could be found. Now, I just want to take a moment and reflect on that. As a parent myself, I would like to think that if my child did some despicable shit, that I would do the right thing and either get her to turn herself in or aid the police in, in capturing her. Um, but I guess unless you're in that situation, you can't say definitively what you would do. So I want to give a shout out to Lillian Graham for doing the right thing and getting her son to turn himself in. Now, once Marty was in custody, here's the crazy thing. He tried to convince police that the bodies were in his apartment when he moved in. Like the previous tenant left them there. I mean, I know when you move, you know, sometimes a broom gets left behind. Sometimes a vase is sitting in a cabinet. But who leaves dead bodies? Like, that would be the most disgusting housewarming idea ever. And look, you and I know that's bullshit. And the police knew it was bullshit. So eventually, Marty confessed to strangling seven women. And during his confession, he was quoted as saying, it was just something that started to happen. Like a bad habit? Like biting your nails? Like picking up smoking? Of the seven women, he was only able to identify five. His first victim was a woman named Robin de Chazor. Now, she was a girlfriend of Marty's, and he'd even talked to his mother about Robin years ago. 
Um, Robin had been pregnant one, at one point, according to Marty, but the baby had died. Robin had been missing for two and a half years. One victim was identified by the police, and Marty confirmed that her name was Mary Jeters. And the three other victims that Marty was able to name were Cynthia Brooks, who was 28, Barbara Mahoney, who was 22, and Patricia Franklin, who was 24. Now, some of these women, like Robin, lived with Marty for a time, and others he just picked up in the neighborhood. He didn't know the names of the two women that he met on the street, and one of them was indeed Sandra Garvin, who I mentioned a few minutes ago. Marty's approach at murder was pretty simple. He would invite them back to his shooting range, and that's what he liked to call his apartment because he created an environment where people could come in safely and comfortably shoot up and hang out. So he invited them back to his shooting range. He would give them drugs and alcohol to get them high. And then he would strangle these women during consensual sex. Marty said he would then fall asleep and wake up with a dead body in his bed, which he told officers was always surprising to him. Now, for you and I, if we fell asleep with a dead body in the bed, we would expect to see it there when we woke up. But remember, Marty had significant intellectual disabilities. So again, this was very surprising to him. A lot of what I read reflected on his childhood, and, and Harris and Marty Graham had an incredibly difficult childhood. Now, I am not saying that this is in any way an excuse for what he did, but there is no way that this guy was destined for anything other than misery. As a very young boy, Marty was used by a male pimp. Um, he was used by being put out on the street with Johns and he was used by the pimp himself. And I apologize for the pauses here, but this is, you know, this is difficult to talk about. Um, at a very young age, Marty spent time living on the streets in Philadelphia. Um, occasionally he would get out of the streets and wind up in foster care, and then he'd wind up back on the streets. And when he was on the streets, he was exposed to both prostitution and drugs all by the time he was a teenager. So Marty basically had like the shittiest childhood ever. And I don't know how anyone survives those experiences without being significantly damaged. So by late August, Marty was arraigned. And as you can imagine, his mental health came into question. Now, he wrote a 10-page statement during the interrogation when he was arrested. And it was filled with bizarre anecdotes. Um, there was one story that he told about maggots in the apartment, and when people would come to visit, he explained them away as fur balls. He talked about how normally he liked to stage his victims in the front room of his house, but when he knew he was going to be evicted, he had to toss the bodies in the back bedroom so no one would see them. Clearly, there's something wrong with someone who, who acts in this way, someone who takes the life of another. I mean, that's a given. But in Marty's case, remember, he had a significant intellectual disability. It's reported that he had a, an IQ of 63, which is below the level of mental competence. He suffered from hallucinations, from psychosis. I mean, these were probably brought on by his excessive drug use. He was severely paranoid, and he was also considered academically incompetent. So when you think about all of this, you probably expect that he would have been declared incompetent to stand trial. That's what I was expecting. Um, that would be no. Philly Judge Edward Meckel declared that Marty was actually competent enough to stand trial, and he based this decision on the DA's insistence that Marty was, and I'm quoting here, able during his confession. Now, you know, do we believe Marty committed these horrible crimes? We absolutely do. I do. I'm guessing you do too after hearing all of this. Um, but do I believe that Marty and his mother, who was with him at the time of his confession, should have been told that he had the right to have an attorney present during this confession? I absolutely do. There is a reason we have due process. There's a reason someone is supposed to be told that they have the right to an attorney. I'm not ashamed to admit to you that the sentencing confuses me a little bit. Marty was sentenced to six consecutive sentences of seven to 14 years each, six death sentences, and one life sentence. So when I do the math, he could be in jail for 42 to 84 years or be put to death six times or simply be in jail for the remainder of his life. Then the judge declared that Marty cannot be executed until he serves his life sentence. But if you serve life in jail, aren't you already dead when you're done serving? Like, I mean, how would that even work? How do you get put to death 
after you served life. The whole point of serving life means your life ends while you're in prison. So I don't get any of that. Um, I'm going to fast forward at this point to 1994. Now, Marty's been in jail for years. And in 1994, his sentence was considered illegal. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court unanimously decided that his death sentence must be carried out. So I guess they looked at the sentencing instructions and thought, what the fuck, just like I did. His execution was scheduled for December of that year. Um, and then he received a stay of execution. His execution was delayed again multiple times until 2000 and then again until 2002. Now, that became his saving grace because 2002 is the year that the U.S. Supreme Court banned the execution of people who were then called mentally retarded. Marty's legal team worked tirelessly to prove that he met the standard to have his death sentence vacated, and that's exactly what happened. On December 20th, 2003, his life sentence was restored. Harrison Marty Graham is incarcerated at Cole Township Jail, where he's been since 94. The prison actually opened in 93, so he was moved there. And while he was in prison, he got his minister's certificate and devoutly practices his faith with fellow inmates. Now, I remember seeing Marty's story on the news the summer after I graduated high school and thinking, like, who would kill seven women? And then I don't remember much about it after that. Back then, the idea of some of this twisted shit would have been sort of freaky to me. And I'm not sure when my thinking changed. Um, maybe it's all the Stephen King books I read, but I started reading them when I was 11, so that's probably not it. Um, maybe it was uh, my first haunted history tour during New Orleans. I can't honestly say um, that I remember when I started my affinity for all things twisted, but um, I appreciate you taking this journey with me, and I hope that I am among friends. You can find out more details about Marty online, um, especially details from his trial and his defense team, which I decided not to include. Um, yeah, I wanted to focus more on him, on Harrison Marty Graham, his crimes and his victims. He was a fairly prolific serial killer in Philadelphia in the late 80s, and he's barely known by anyone. This was some nasty business. It was nefarious, and it was definitely twisted. That's all from me on this first episode of Twisted Philly, and uh, I leave you with this. Don't be like Marty. Please take out your trash.